Um, no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> if I have trouble, you just run up, okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Hey there. So I know that the sound here is a little bit tricky because there's going to be somebody talking right behind me, which will make it hard for me to hear myself. But if you also suffer from this problem, like wave at me and I'll, I'll get a little bit louder. Um, my name is Rainy Reitman and I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, EFF is a nonprofit civil liberties law firm and advocacy center. We're based in San Francisco uh, and we uh, defend internet freedom in a wide range of ways, um, uh, including um, by advocating for it in the public sphere like we're doing here today, but also through impact litigation where we take on uh, lawsuits, uh, often suing uh, the US government for privacy infringement and things of that nature. And I noticed this is actually not my presentation, so I'm going to quickly scooch over and try and find the right one. So one second. Okay, so like I was saying before I realized I didn't have the right presentation up, uh, EFF is a law firm and an advocacy center. So we engage in impact litigation, which means that we actually uh, review court cases and look for things that will cause bad legal precedent and involve ourselves uh, defending users' rights. Um, uh, we create freedom enhancing technologies, uh, for example, HTTPS Everywhere, which is a free Firefox tool, uh, which we also have a alpha version in Chrome, and if you don't have it already, I strongly recommend you download it. It uh, allows you to uh, uh, go directly to HTTPS instead of the HTTP version of sites on over a thousand websites. Um, we uh, are involved in policy discussions, including groups like the OECD or uh, uh, just blogging uh, to sort of inform people about issues that affect them. 
And then the thing that I want to talk to you guys today about is uh, online activism uh, and how uh, EFF and other organizations are involving hundreds and thousands of people from around the world in speaking out and working together to defend their online rights. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about internet freedom in the next 45 minutes-ish. Uh, and I thought I would start it off by giving you some examples of sort of what are these threats that we're talking about here. Um, and I wanted to start uh, by talking about Stephanie Lenz. Let's see if I can get this to play. I think I might not be able to. I don't even know what that says. So I'm going to hit cancel. Um, so Stephanie Lenz is a mom, and she had a, a, a young son. Oh, I don't want you to do this. Um, sorry, I've got it bothering me. Um, uh, and she, she taped a video of her son, uh, it was 29 seconds long, uh, bouncing around their kitchen uh, to a little bit of music in the background. The background music is completely inaudible in the, in the video. And uh, she put it up online so that her friends and family members would be able to see her son uh, in their kitchen hanging out and playing. And Universal uh, contacted her and, and had an and had the video removed from YouTube, uh, saying that uh, it violated their copyright. Now keep in mind that copyright is something uh, that's supposed to be a limited uh, monopoly on something so that uh, you, your rights to, to sell it are not infringed upon. I hardly think that anybody out there, instead of buying this, this full-length uh, music CD, would be listening to 29 basically inaudible seconds for Stephanie Lenz's uh, video. Um, Stephanie Lenz came to EFF and uh, we actually sued uh, uh, Universal Studios uh, saying that they had um, uh, been uh, misusing the, the copyright process and the DMCA process to uh, take down legitimate speech and fair use. Um, this is one thing that sometimes internet threats will look like. It will look like um, content from the internet. Uh, music and and blogs and pictures being taken down or being uh, blocked so that you won't be able to get to them. And sometimes this form of censorship will happen as a result of copyright. Um, Edwin Armstrong uh, invented and field tested uh, the FM radio back in the early 1930s. He was uh, a very uh, intelligent guy, some might call him a genius, uh, and he found that FM radio uh, broadcasts further with more clarity and more powerful than AM radio signals. And he was so excited about his invention that he wanted to bring it to the entire world. Um, however, uh, industry uh, at that time was heavily invested in AM radio and they didn't want this FM radio to come onto the scene and potentially threaten their business model and as a result uh, they engaged Edwin Armstrong for years in ongoing patent litigation um, they pressured the FCC the Federal Communications Commission to prevent them from allocating adequate spectrum to FM radio and Edwin died uh, years later, having spent his entire life just trying to bring technology to the world, he died uh, impoverished, actually stepping out of the 13th floor of his apartment in New York, um, bankrupt. And this is something else that an internet threat might look like. It might look like a company that's trying, that has a vested interest in something, trying to prevent new technologies from reaching the market when people might want to use them. Uh, it might look like people abusing the regulatory process or the legal process uh, for their own uh, self-interest rather than the interests of uh, society at large. Um, PATH, I don't know, does anybody use PATH? I've yet to find anyone who uses PATH, but it's a social network that's quite um, well known at this point, mostly for a privacy scandal that happened earlier this year. Um, a researcher uh, who was trying to hack away at PATH uh, found that PATH was automatically uh, uh, going through your contacts uh, when you used it and, and uploading them to its own servers out on the web. Um, and this caused a, uh, an enormous outcry from, from privacy advocates. And the CEO of PATH went on to apologize. He said, we thought we were doing the right thing. Uh, it turns out we made a mistake. 
And it resulted in uh, Congress, the U.S. Congress, uh, submitting a ton of letters to uh, similar apps and uh, a, a slew of news stories. And what came out of it was that lots and lots of different apps are doing this, are accessing more data than they should without your direct permission, are storing it in ways that users don't necessarily expect. And this is what another threat to online freedom might look like. It might look like norms that companies have established uh, really uh, being centered around what they want and what their business needs are rather than about what users want and what their privacy interests are with their own data. Um, and it's also about non-transparent data collection. Uh, the, the, so the thought that this data was, was being taken away and everyday internet users who were using PATH, um, I, I do presume they do exist, uh, had no idea that this was taking place. Um, Mark Klein is a, or was for many, many years, a technician at AT&T. Uh, he came to EFF quite distraught years ago, back in 2005, and he brought papers with him uh, that showcased a secret room that AT&T had uh, uh, where they had uh, installed fiber optic splitters that made a copy of all of the internet traffic that went through their uh, their uh, Folsom Street facility. Um, uh, this whistleblower evidence became the uh, the ba the base of a lawsuit that EFF has pursued um, for for many many years now since 2006. Um, trying to hold the United States government uh, accountable uh, for warrantlessly wiretapping uh, American um, uh, communications and also trying to hold AT&T, the telecom, accountable for helping them out. And what's been so frustrating in this case is that uh, the government is 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 arguing state secrets that they don't have to tell us whether or not this was taking place at all and we can't even submit our evidence. Um, and this is what another threat to internet freedom might look like. It might look like the government shrouding its own actions and its surveillance in, uh, in forms of secrecy uh, and, and pleading state secrets or classification and, uh, and also a widespread data collection where everyone is treated like a potential criminal. Um, all of these different rights that we have in the, in the offline world to speak freely, to communicate, uh, to have our own privacy, to innovate new products uh, can be threatened in a range of ways through uh, uh, online functions. Um, we see it through both laws and uh, corporate policies and societal norms. Uh, for example, uh, how many people here use PGP to encrypt their email? We got one. We got like seven. <laughs> right now, it's not a societal norm for us all to use PGP. And think of how much more privacy we would have as a society if all of our emails were encrypted in a way that we were certain was secure, relatively, um, and uh, rather than relying on some third party uh, company like Gmail to uh, encrypt it for us. Um, uh, and there's also uh, secret treaties and secret negotiations. I'm going to talk about one in a little while, whereby uh, big interests, whether it's companies or uh, governments, are making decisions that affect internet policy, affect everybody who uses the internet, and internet users aren't in the room and have no idea what the discussions are about. Um, these are some of the threats that we're dealing with every single day, and whether or not we are successful in fighting back against these threats will determine what the future of the internet looks like. Um, I, I often talk about uh, you know, the internet of being a, a series of, of, of weak links, that uh, the very disparate nature of the internet uh, that allows us to get our speech out there and is very difficult to censor has also created uh, certain ways uh, that uh, certain points which can become hubs for censorship or surveillance. Um, that uh, the way that we uh, put our information out there relies on, on web hosts and the DNS and, and your users have to, or your readers need to have an ISP to connect to the internet or perhaps you're using third party platforms like Facebook and such. I'm sorry it's a little bit gray, you can't quite make out the whole graphic. Um, uh, that each of these points uh, has been 
become a locus for uh, governments and companies to focus censorship tools and to focus surveillance tools. And we saw that quite clearly with SOPA and PIPA. Uh, SOPA was a Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, it was a, a very difficult battle we faced in the United States for a piece of legislation whose entire intent was to stop uh, internet users from uh, downloading a, a content from the internet that was believed to infringe on copyrights um, and also to uh, to uh, do the best that they could to stop this from taking place by attacking whole websites um, the the scary thing about SOPA in particular was that in order to have this to 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 reach this goal of stopping piracy on the internet, it was willing to sacrifice uh, free expression on the web as we know it. It was willing to say, if there's an allegation of, of piracy, uh, you can take down a whole domain. You can force a search engine not to serve search results that include that domain. You can uh, have online intermediaries like payment providers and uh, and platforms like Facebook and such be held liable for the, the speech they have and be forced to take it down. Um, and it was targeted specifically um, at uh, international sites. So they, they wanted it to be based on uh, uh, so that US users wouldn't be using uh, sites overseas, um, maybe in Europe, <laughs> to, download, uh, to download pirated content and, and to, to take this stuff down. But it could have also been used uh, uh, to attack uh, US-based sites. Um, uh, for example, payment providers would be uh, able to cut off uh, online payments for a, com for a website uh, just on an allegation of uh, facilitating online piracy regardless of whether or not they were actually doing so. It also um, uh, criminalized circumvention tools. So if you use the technical measure to go around this type of censorship in order to get to a site that was supposed to be blocked, uh, you, uh, it, the tool itself would be uh, violating this law if it had been made into a law. Um, these are the type of circumvention tools that activists in authoritarian regimes rely on to access the free and open web. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of things they were willing to sacrifice with this law. Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, we were able to have a large-scale protest against this law. We actually had several, uh, but the one we had on January 18th uh, got a lot more news than the other ones. Um, we had uh, over 100,000 websites uh, black out their, their pages. Um, this is a picture of Google's homepage on our protest day. Um, they, they blacked out their page and they asked people to contact Congress and tell them not to censor the internet. Wikipedia also blacked out their page. Uh, tons of other pages uh, blacked out. Um, we, uh, we built a, uh, a petition page on EFF.org, uh, which uh, resu was quite an undertaking for us. <laughs> And um, uh, we were able to get uh, a, a number of websites like Minecraft and Wired and other sites, uh, Mozilla, to redirect all their traffic over to us uh, so that uh, when people logged on to visit those sites, they would end up on EFF. They would find out about this terrible law that was about to be uh, uh, voted on, and they would be able to contact Congress and speak out against it. Um, and we generated over a million emails to Congress that day. Um, Eight million people uh, looked up their representatives via Wikipedia. Some 4.5 million people signed Google's petition against it. Um, Twitter recorded 2.4 million SOPA-related tweets. Uh, the phone lines in Congress were jammed with uh, just, they, they, like literally, they just ringing off the hook. Um, and we had well over 100,000 sites put up uh, uh, some form of censored logo or black out their entire site or go down and redirect to somebody else. Um, this is a picture of our petition page. Um, and I wanted to talk about this because ever since that happened, when I talked to staffers in Washington, D.C., they're scared of the internet. They're scared of what our power is and what we're like when we're all working together. And they're always saying, please don't SOPA this. 
when they talk about legislation and, uh, uh, and they have this deep sense of not wanting to rock the boat when it comes to the internet community again. And that's an incredible power that we've just now started to tap into, uh, which I think is going to have a, make a huge change for sort of policy discussions around the internet going forward, that finally legislators are thinking uh, that they have to listen to internet users or else we will speak out against them. Um, I want to say that a lot of people looked at the uh, the blackout day on January 18th and they thought, wow, that was great that the internet community rose up and threw that together all at once like that. Um, and it was actually a very long, slow process in the making. Um, I know that uh, the first blackout day was called for by Redditors um, who have become an incredibly politicized uh, online community. Um, and uh, Wikipedia had, uh, I, I think, weeks of discussions about whether or not to get involved. Uh, and then we had had uh, blogs and outreach and advocacy around SOPA from the day it had been introduced. And prior to that, there had been a, a bill similar to it called COICA, which we'd been fighting. Um, and this had been our second online protest. So there was a sense that when we started, it was small, and there weren't that many people listening to us. But over time, people became convinced that it was a huge issue. And that they needed to be speaking out and doing something. And slowly the tide turned and we were able to have a huge and very public impact. Um, and so whenever you're working on a small campaign, I would just remind you that even the biggest of campaigns start uh, quite, quite small. Um, so uh, a slightly smaller campaign that we recently did uh, was against the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. This is a bill uh, that uh, was bandied about in the House of Representatives in the United States and actually passed the US House uh, this year. Um, so technically, it could come up in the Senate and pass there as well and become a law. It's still up in the air. It's still something we're watching closely. Um, CISPA, as it was called, would let companies like Facebook or Google um, monitor your online communications, uh, literally the content of your emails and such, uh, for what they have called uh, cyber threats. Uh, and uh, this was a pretty nebulously defined term. And if uh, they believed that there was a cyber threat in it, they had the ability to, to pass the unredacted content of your emails to the government without a warrant. And this would affect people overseas who used uh, uh, US-based services like Gmail. Um, as well as people in the United States. Um, we were deeply disturbed by, um, by CISPA. We were particularly upset about CISPA as it allowed data to flow directly to the National Security Agency. Uh, the NSA is a, a very untransparent agency in the United States, uh, primarily uh, tasked with spying. Um, and they, they aren't supposed to be collecting data on American citizens, but they would have been able to if this law had gone into effect. Um, and once data had been collected for quote unquote cybersecurity purposes, it could have been used to prosecute uh, wholly unrelated crimes. Um, and uh, uh, some people worked to get uh, amendments to this bill that would help uh, address some of these privacy concerns. Most of those amendments didn't even make it to the floor. So we had another online protest. Um, we got together with a, a wide range of uh, advocacy groups like Reporters Without Borders and the ACLU and Avaz. And we created this online tool where you could uh, look up uh, your representative and uh, find their Twitter handle. And if they didn't have a Twitter handle or if you didn't have a representative, then uh, it would just find the leadership and it would tweet messages to them. And rather than just tell people, hey, oppose this bill, it's a terrible idea for privacy, uh, we asked people to um, actually tweet about how they use the internet every day. And uh, uh, sort of like the, the mundane but kind of personal ways that we use the internet, the kind of data that would be inadvertently collected uh, if this bill were to be uh, put into place and then pass to the government. Um, and it was... Uh, Pretty successful. Uh, we were able to very much change uh, the tenor of the conversation uh, around these bills. We didn't stop CISPA from passing in the House, but we did kill the bill in the Senate. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to kill any future bill in the Senate, and this won't become a law. Um, 
So those are two examples of sort of like online protests we did this year that were able to uh, s change uh, the debate and, and affect major change of policymakers and make them sit up and listen to internet users. Um, and I want to talk to you very briefly about things that we that we need help with, that are pending threats uh, that uh, we could very much use uh, more people getting involved with. Um, uh, the first one is a website uh, that we recently put up, well, not that recently, a couple of months ago, called globalchokepoints.org. Uh, this is a website, um, I didn't get a very good screenshot of it, but um, uh, basically, in a number of different countries, um, uh, we have seen uh, intellectual property laws where if someone is accused of violating intellectual property laws uh, uh, three times, uh, they can have their internet uh, cut off. They'll be disconnected from the internet. Um, and there are, can be a number of other penalties involved in this. Uh, we've seen people in South Korea already have their internet cut off. In France, this was uh, hugely controversial, uh, and they have recently defunded the law in place there now. We have a few countries uh, that we're watching closely. Some of them already have these quote-unquote three strikes laws in place. Other countries have bad IP laws, but we're watching them closely to see whether or not they'll have one of these uh, three strikes laws put into place. Um, uh, these laws have been uh, criticized by the UN uh, Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. He said he was alarmed by proposals to disconnect users from the internet uh, if they violate violate intellectual property laws, and he specifically named laws in the UK and in France. Um, right now, these laws are already on the books, and what's so scary about this issue is that um, we've seen them in a couple of countries. Content owners are pushing these laws everywhere. They are pushing them in other countries, uh, and they are pushing uh, U.S. lobbyists, quite frankly, to uh, advocate to get uh, stronger intellectual property laws on countries that don't want it internationally. Um, and as we saw with SOPA, a lot of times these IP laws uh, can be abused uh, for online censorship. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, briefly was the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, have you guys heard of this? Anybody? Okay, one person, two people. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is a, um, uh, it's an international treaty. It's a little bit like ACTA six years ago um, in that it is uh, currently being negotiated and it's happening behind closed doors, which means that uh, we don't get to know what the negotiations are. We don't get to know uh, what the positions are that they're trying, what they're trying to achieve through these negotiations. But we do know that they're trying to create intellectual property uh, regulations through these uh, negotiations. And there's been a leaked version of the um, uh, IP uh, chapter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Also, I'm sorry, my, my graphic doesn't have Canada and Mexico who also are involved in this. Um, uh, and, you know, this this uh, intellectual property chapter uh, had a number of things, but they're still very much up in the air as what the final version of this is going to look like. Uh, among other things, they wanted to uh, create an international standard for the minimum copyright duration to be gone, to be increased from life plus 50 years uh, to life plus 70 years. Um, and uh, uh, this would just further devalue the, the public domain, the things that we can use and create without having to ask anybody's permission for. Um, and then there are other components of the TPP that could affect other online rights. Uh, but I think for us, the major concern is uh, these, these, these deep-pocketed Hollywood lobbyists, they weren't able to push their agenda through the U.S. Congress. And so they've taken it to these backroom negotiations where they're trying to negotiate and push for, uh, for certain regulations without having uh, a, a democratic process where people like you and I uh, could find out about it and, and speak up and if our elected officials voted for it, we could get rid of our elected officials. Uh, instead, they're trying to do it through this uh, regulatory uh, international trade agreement. Um, and so we're, we're very concerned about that. Um, and, um, and so what we're planning on doing is a couple of activism campaigns around this and, and other issues. Uh, and our, our hope is to get, you know, as with 
uh, the campaigns that have been most successful, campaigns which have a very loud voice, which are able to grab the media's attention, which are able to introduce people who maybe don't know anything about online rights uh, to the issue, um, and to, to have them be carefully sculpted so that they specifically go to decision makers who can actually influence the issues. Um, and ultimately, campaigns that illuminate the problem that they're trying to fix. With Blackout Day, we were able to showcase uh, the problems of SOPA by blacking out the web to say, if you pass this bill, our web will be censored in ways it shouldn't be. Uh, and with CISPA, we were able to say, you know, with our campaign, if you pass this bill, you'll be collecting data on us uh, that honestly, you ought to be going to a court and getting a warrant in order to get. Um, and so uh, the very best online campaigns are ones which, even as they're advocating for and, and uh, uh, educating people about an issue, are also illustrating the problem that they're trying to combat. Um, a lot of times people are like, well, what can I possibly do about these things? And what's so funny is that you can do the smallest thing and it can make the biggest difference. Um, with SOPA and with some of these other campaigns, it was literally just about regular people signing petitions and then telling their friends and getting them to sign petitions. And enough people did that that we were actually able to kill a bill that would have deeply, deeply hurt the internet. And so every time you have an opportunity to sign one of these petitions and you think it's not going to do any good, it's not going to make a difference, so why should I bother? You should bother. <laughs> Um, because it, it can make a huge difference. Um, and then, you know, obviously the next step after that is uh, being willing to actually pick up the phone and, and call a legislator and tell them face to face, hey, what you're doing is, is wrong for the internet and it's wrong for my freedoms and I'm not going to stand for it. Um, uh, you could attend a rally or event. Active protests were just truly phenomenal um, and uh, were able to do amazing work to get that sort of uh, pushed down in Europe. Um, and then if you're somebody who maintains a blog, you can blog about these issues uh, or actually go and meet with your elected officials uh, in person. Or if you really, really care about these issues and you want to make a difference and you want to make sure that the web is as free and open in 30 years as it is today, if not even more so, uh, then you should come up to me afterwards and we'll talk. Um, I think uh, there is so much room for creativity and uh, a chain and uh, exploring and uh, sort of uh, making online campaigns your your own. Um, I think that uh, when we saw the SOPA campaign, we actually saw artists and creators and innovators uh, coming up with new fun tools to automatically censor tweets or uh, uh, put up interesting graphics around it. Um, we have people who are embedding uh, widgets on their sites to let people who visit their sites automatically sign these petitions. Um, Move Your Domain Day was a campaign against GoDaddy. GoDaddy had come out uh, pro-SOPA. Uh, which was a, a ridiculous move on their part. And so there was this huge online campaign to get people to move their domains off of GoDaddy. Um, and uh, there were some beautiful music videos and rallies. And all of these things, no matter what you are or what you're doing, are ways that you can um, use your own expertise to contribute to the fight. Um, we recently uh, launched the Internet Defense League. Have any of you guys heard about this yet? couple of people. I was, um, I'm on their uh, steering committee of the Internet Defense League and EFF is a, a member and I was at the party in San Francisco where we had a very big cat signal that looked kind of like this and it was truly phenomenal. Um, and the idea behind the Internet Defense League is that the people who are pushing these anti-freedom agendas are working all the time. They're thinking constantly about how they can push their laws and push their policies and get, you know, to defend what their interests are in the fight. And too often, uh, those of us who are fighting for civil liberties, who are fighting for free speech, we're just sitting around waiting for them to, uh, to come up with some bad proposal and then scrambling to get organized to fight back against it. And so the Internet Defense League kind of changes all that. They say, let's organize now. Let's get together now and commit that if anything shows up on the horizon that threatens our online rights, we've already got a structure in place that we can react quickly, that we can spread the word incredibly quickly. Um, 
one of the one of the features of the Internet Defense League is if you have a website or a blog or whatever, um, you can embed code onto it uh, that uh, you can either have it something you manually update or it can happen automatically. And then if there's a serious threat to online rights and the Internet Defense League uh, identifies it and and uh, and finds it to be something of such imminent danger that we need everyone to get involved, uh, the code on your site will um, sort of blossom out and and ask people who visit the site to uh, to take action. Or if you want to do it manually, you'll just get an email and you can go embed this content uh, yourself. Um, so that's one of the new sort of creative ways that we are working to uh, sort of get more organized and, and push uh, to, to show that the internet is not going to stand idly by while they, uh, while they try to regulate our freedoms away. Um, and we also have a, a movement um, uh, called the uh, Declaration of Internet Freedom. Um, this is a project that has um, thousands of advocacy organizations involved with it right now, as well as um, tens if not hundreds of thousands, probably hundreds at this point, of internet users who have signed on. And what we're doing is we're going to elected officials and we're asking them to sign on to principles to defend the internet, uh, to defend specifically expression, uh, don't censor the internet, uh, access, promote universal access to fast and affordable networks, openness, keep the internet an open network where everyone is free to connect, communicate, write, read, watch, speak, listen, learn, create, and innovate. Uh, innovation, uh, protect the freedom to innovate and create without permission, don't block new technologies, and don't punish innovators uh, for their users' actions. And privacy, protect privacy and defend everyone's ability to control how their data and devices are use used. We've already got elected officials in the US who have signed on to this. We've got some major names as well who have signed up to support this. And our hope is that we'll be able to go um, uh, to all sorts of different elected officials and get them to, to sign on to this and say that they won't uh, pass any legislation that undermines these basic fundamental principles. And the hope is that when uh, voters go into the voting booth, they'll keep in mind, hey, does the person I'm voting for support these principles of a free and open internet or are they someone who refused to sign it? And perhaps it influences them, perhaps it doesn't, but at least we've got everybody stating for facts, yes or no, on whether or not they're going to stand up for online freedoms. And we're finally uh, having this voice towards policymakers on it. Um, and if you haven't done so already, I strongly urge you to sign up for EFF.org's uh, EFF mail, mailing list and our Twitter and our Identica and our, our Facebook, if you're into Facebook, and Google+. Plus. Um, what we do is we also serve as our own sort of uh, outlet for getting the word out when there's a, a threat on the horizon. Um, and uh, we, we, we're working to kind of educate people about their rights and, and speak out about them and also to let people know when there are these terrible laws and policies that are going to affect the free and open web and give you guys a way to, to speak out and make a difference. Um, so please, if you haven't done so already, um, uh, consider joining. So um, I just want to reiterate that there's, there's room in this movement for everybody. That if you're a blogger, you can start blogging about internet rights and, and start changing people's opinions and making a difference. If you're a developer, then you can create software that actually fosters uh, free speech and privacy. I think sometimes that decisions made by developers in companies can have such a huge impact on, on our freedoms and they don't even realize it, right? They're just like, oh, I'm just some guy at Facebook and I decided that this was what the privacy settings were going to be, you know, three years ago. And yet it, it today has this huge ripple effect where we create communities online that are either supportive of our fundamental freedoms or take for granted that they're not going to exist. So I, particularly if you're a developer, an engineer, um, really think about uh, these issues when you're creating technologies. Um, if you're a voter, you know, some people are, uh, then keep internet rights in mind when you're casting your vote. Uh, and if you uh, make policies or you regulate, you know, this is, this is your chance to get involved and start defending the web with us. Um, and I also wanted to end uh, by talking about a, a protest that's going to be happening in September. It's September 14th through 17th. It's called Freedom Not Fear. Uh, and it's, uh, they're going to have it in Brussels and Luxembourg. 
And historically, they've had one in Berlin. But as far as I know, they don't have one planned for Berlin right now. Uh, I'm really hoping that that changes and that there is going to be some sort of a, an event here in Berlin as well. And this, this protest actually gets tons and tons of people out on the streets uh, fighting uh, back against government surveillance and saying, you don't have to sacrifice our privacy rights to have security. Uh, you don't have to uh, surveil people who have never been suspected of committing any crime uh, simply to, uh, to bolster your, your quote-unquote anti-terrorism agenda or what have you. Um, and so I'd really urge you, if you're based locally or if you can possibly make it, to get out, to check out the website uh, and to take a, a day actually out on the streets making a difference and speaking up for uh, online rights and, and taking a stand against surveillance. Um, and so that's my spiel. Um, I have stickers here, um, which are great and you should get some. And I, I want to open this up for questions and also for kind of comments. I know that there's a lot of issues that other folks have been working on uh, in internet freedom arena. Um, and if you've got issues that you think you, know, you want to raise as well, then please, uh, now is the time. Uh, thank you, first of all. Um, I have a question um, concerning... Uh, Hello? Hello? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think how um, like everyday people can get more involved in um, defending the internet apart from um, just like signing petitions and protesting? Because I think it seems like a very reactionary way of um, dealing with this problem. I would really like to get involved in uh, these policies in like my everyday life in, in some way or another. So, I don't know if, okay, this thing does work. Okay, um, so I think that there's a, a lot of different ways. Uh, and I think part of it is, you know, if you are somebody who, who works at a company that creates tools and technologies, you have a very unique ability to create online environments that foster free speech and privacy and innovation. Um, and I also think that uh, there's, there's this really important role that all of us can play in educating others about it. Uh, you know, it's so funny because there's millions and millions of internet users who have no idea that, uh, that you know, their rights are hanging by this very delicate thread. And if we could just tell more people about it. Um, and so if you're nothing else, I, I hope that everyone here becomes an evangelist for these issues and, and takes an opportunity to, to speak out and tell people who don't know uh, why, it, why it makes a difference. Uh, so those are two things I would say uh, would be the simplest things for everyday users to, to do. Other thoughts? Hi. Um, you mentioned PATH, but I was wondering what do you think about uh, like other threats from within the internet, like uh, Facebook creating a sub-internet uh, in a walled garden within itself and killing off the web in the process? So I think that's a, a really dangerous problem. Um, one of the ways that we, ch so his question, in case you didn't hear it, was like, what do you think about walled gardens that try to create sub-internets? And then within those sub-internets, you've got corporate policies that dictate what kind of speech is and isn't OK. I was working, um, was it last week? Last week, I was working with political uh, organizers who are trying to promote laws in the United States uh, to, uh, to advocate for marijuana policy reform. And they found that these ads were automatically removed from Facebook, and they, they weren't able to get them seen. Now, Facebook has this huge community. It's an incredible way for people to advertise, right? Um, and the fact that these are legitimate political movements that are trying to pass bills in various states in the U.S., um, you know, whether or not they're able to, I don't know. But they weren't actually, it was a political issue that was actually getting removed from Facebook altogether. And so I'm deeply, deeply concerned about 
the corporate policies that are already in effect that are affecting free speech. And I think one thing we should try to do is push for better data portability. Um, as long as you can take all your data out of a service, you at least have the possibility that you could go to a competing service. Uh, I don't think that's the only solution. I think we've got to actually have decent competing services. And I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that helps to spur that, interestingly, is uh, security research. You have security researchers who uh, investigate, uh, you know, somebody like Facebook or whatever, find they have this huge privacy violation. It results in a ton of media outcry. People decide they don't want to use Facebook anymore. Where do they go? They need another service, right? And so then you've got this, this market force to get a competitive service in there. So I think all of these things can kind of work together, but... Um, but I agree with you that that is a really concerning problem and one I think we're only going to have to deal with more. Here's another question. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question about the Global Network Initiative. I know it's kind of been in the background and has had some trouble getting off the ground it seems, and your thoughts about just sharing best practice, because it all seems like very case-specific. Facebook does this, and we do this, and that rallies kind of like the people to get behind internet freedom, right? but developing a their thoughts on Center for Best Practice. So um, I don't work on uh, GNI myself, um, but my sense has been, and I, you know, I apologize in advance if anybody feels differently, but my sense has been that Companies join GNI so they can say they're members of the Global Network Initiative, but they're, they're not actually committing to make serious changes to their policies to defend freedoms. And so I've been, I've been, I'd like to see GNI do more. Um, and I, I don't know that GNI is ultimately going to be the best hub for enacting change. You have... <laughs> yeah, I just... Is it, hello? Hello? Um, I was just wondering how you see that happening in the best way. Because it seems like if we know what what is right and, and what's wrong, and that's what the GNI was designed to do, create a center for best practice. So if I'm a new company starting out, I could say, okay, this is kind of the policy that upholds internet freedoms, rather right. than looking at kind of a list of 10 things, which is, is really nice and inspiring. But when you're right. actually building something to say, kind of look comparatively. So I think that actually, you know, in theory, having this sort of, like formal method, formal organizational like group sort of figuring out, you know, best practices actually works really well. The problem is that the members within the GNI have this vested interest in putting those best practices as low as possible so that it's easy for them to, to hit those standards, right? And so what ends up happening is that all of the members are these big, big companies and then they make the standards so easy that anybody can can hit them and then, you know, and so I think that, you know, as important as those best practices are, uh, it's also really important to have sort of people outside of that group, people who are independent, who are journalists, who are advocates, who are fighting, uh, and who are willing to uh, unabashedly uh, and fearlessly criticize them when they mess up. Um, so... I don't know. We'll, we'll wait to see. Maybe GNI will become more productive, or maybe there will be another another thing like GNI that comes up. I've been talking about creating one. So ah, yes. Chat. So yes, I think there's a need. Cool. <laughs> Would you agree that not? All intellectual property, right, property is inherently evil. It just tends to be the implementation in law of trying to protect this. And if so, how, how would you suggest balancing the rights of the individual versus the rights of the copyright holder? Oh, that's a really big question. I do, th <laughs> I do think that there, um, there are certainly certain extremely limited, you know, carefully narrowed uh, times when copyright might make sense. Um, the problem is that nothing like that exists right now. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that ultimately what we want to do is create a way for artists to get paid. And as long as the system we have put into place results in an artist getting paid for their work, then I don't know that we need to have DRM and all of these other crazy institutions put in place to try and limit copying and, and creation and pushing of, of, uh, of 
of uh, content to, to individuals who want to consume it, right? And so I think that um, there's actually the, the best solution would be many different solutions. It's going to be people who are coming up with different business models and people who are coming up with, you know, different uh, ways of getting artists paid, you know, artist collectives, who knows. Uh, and and the, as long as we have a, a wide range of different options, that's probably going to be the solution that makes the most sense. So w would you say that would involve coming up with a new economic model for it rather than just trying to legislate the problem away? So I think right now, um, I think that the situation we're in today now is the legislation is so bad on copyright that we actually have to go back and pass laws to probably fix it. And that's going to be so hard that I think the best way to address it in, in like the given short term, so like most of our lifetime, is going to be with uh, economic solutions, economic business models uh, that provide alternative ways for people to get paid without, I mean, that's, that's my sense having studied it. I actually think that there's a lot of room here for different people to come up with different ideas. So. Um, on the on the blackout day, um, I saw a lot of websites go down, and and they asked you to sign this uh, peti petition. But because I don't live in U.S. and I couldn't sign them, is there something that we can do outside? Because we just because all I all I had was to just hope that a lot of people in the U.S. will react. But I can't do anything because I'm outside. Right. Um uh, so there were some petitions that uh, were international, so like people could sign on to them. Like I think uh, Demand Progress had one that you could sign on regardless of where you were, uh, and I think Google's probably let you sign. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I actually think it's really important, and it's an unsolved problem. Like I think we need to do a little thinking here because the way all of these online platforms work in the United States, and then we'll. I guess we'll wrap up, um, is they're, they're centered for people based in the United States. But the thing is, the United States is passing internet policy laws that are going to affect people all over the world. So we need to have a way for those people to speak out. One thing um, that uh, people have suggested is that if you live internationally, you should be speaking out to the State Department of the United States. The State Department gets these responses, and then they uh, talk to Congress and then make recommendations. So what we're trying to do we haven't done a great job of it yet, but we're going to do it more, is create uh, two versions of every petition that we make. And one's going to be based in the U.S. So you can contact your legislator. And one is for everybody outside of the U.S. who's going to be affected by this policy. And then they can directly contact the State Department and, uh, 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 and, and have their voices heard as well. Um, I think we have to wrap up because I think they're going to start there. I'm going to be right over here if people want to talk more. I have stickers. They're such great stickers. You're really going to want one of these. And uh, thank you so much for coming out. <laughs>